the scriptures, uh, for the psalms, uh, which we will focus our attention on this evening, and of course, most of all, for the gift of your divine Son, our merciful Lord, who calls us into a deep and abiding relationship with you in heaven, the Holy Spirit. We ask that as we uh, bless our time together this evening, that you help each of us grow in relationship with you, that we may come to know the perfection of your love in this life and to enjoy it forever in the next. We ask all of this. Through the tender and loving intercession of blessed virgins, we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, um, before we dig into... Uh, the content of the presentation. I just want to share with you uh, where I am getting this information. Um, recently, I came across two different sources um, on the Psalms. Uh, one is a general introduction to the uh, Old Testament um, uh, that I think is just quite wonderful. It, it's a thick book. Um, it's not a cheap book, but it's available digitally and hard copy. But I think it's excellent and wonderful enough as a reference um, and uh, one of the ways that I have utilized this resource is that um, when I notice a certain pattern say like in the readings uh, at mass like oh we're getting a lot of Ezekiel right now I'll go to this book and check out its introduction on Ezekiel it's a book called a Catholic introduction to the Bible the Old Testament by John Bergsma and Grant Petrie it's published by Ignatius Press and that is what it looks like and it is well written um, it's definitely um, it's not overly scholarly it's an introduction but I think it's rich enough uh, for, for a variety of people who are just you know not total beginners but also direct and straightforward enough that even somebody who has never read anything about Ezekiel can access it and then they give you resources to go deeper if you excellent excellent readable helpful <clears throat> resource um, uh, I've been excited to know that a lot of seminarians now are being trained with this book in their introductions uh, to the Old Testament um, and I was just delighted but our guys at the Mount I know they use it out in Studentville because Berkman and Peter teach out there <laughs> and um, uh, just I cannot recommend it highly enough then um, Similarly excellent, uh, and it's actually a little series, but I'm going to uh, focus on uh, the one about the Psalms. It's called Psalm Basics for Catholics, Seeing Salvation History in a New Way. And it's by one of the authors of the other book, John Bergsma. It looks like this. You got a little cute little stick man there with a halo <laughs> and a harp, uh, or a lyre in particular. So that's David. <laughs> and um, it is... It's an introduction to the Psalms. It's, it's very basic, but not um, not dumb basic. Uh, it gives a wonderful, wonderful overview of how the Psalms fit into salvation uh, history. Um, he's got another one on an introduction to the Bible in general, I believe, and the other one is an introduction to the New Testament. Um, but um, so that's John Bergsma, uh, uh, Bible Basics for Catholics, is the series. Um, so that is where I am stealing all this content. Is that from Ignatius too? This one is not from Ignatius Press. Uh, this one it's uh, Ave Maria Press. It's Ave Maria Press. Okay. Again, they're all, you know, Amazon, your favorite Catholic bookstore. They're available on the Kindle. Uh, I'm only going back to this. I don't know why. I didn't know they're ready to go. Um, so I'm going to start out uh, with just, uh, I guess, what I'll call some fun facts uh, on the Psalms. Um, first of all, the Psalter, the Book of Psalms, uh, is longer than any other Old Testament book. Now that may surprise us because certain books feel longer. <laughs> it's just like, oh, I can read the Psalms all day, but you know, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, something like that, or, or what is it? Even some of the uh, okay. verses, like Chronicles. the Chronicles. The Chronicles. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So, but the Psalms—it actually is the longest uh, book. Um, 
it's more frequently quoted in the New Testament than any other Old Testament book. Um, uh, and the usage of the Psalms in the New Testament is mostly in their prophetic or messianic sense. So a lot of the Psalms are setting the stage uh, for the Messiah, for Christ. Um, and we're going to talk about that more later. Um, it's also the most extensively read Old Testament book in the lectionary. So um, it comes up more frequently. Now that should be kind of obvious because we read a psalm at every Mass, right? <laughs> you know, um, but that's just a little a note there. Um, it can be seen as the living heartbeat of the church's prayer because it's the basis for all the liturgical prayer of the church. You see that in the uh, Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, which is composed of a series of psalms and some other scripture readings and canticles. Um, and it's also uh, the basis for the sacramental rites of the church. So uh, the psalms feature extensively in how the church goes about uh, establishing and, and communicating the different rituals and rites. Um, the sacred uh, psalms and prayers in the Psalter uh, were also generally intended to be accompanied by one of the various stringed instruments that were used in the temple. That's something we don't often think about because you know we don't utilize them in that way at Mass often, but um, they were originally composed uh, to music. Um, the word psalm comes from the Greek word psalmos, or song, an obvious there, which was often used to translate the Hebrew word mizmor, which means song or melody. In the Hebrew tradition, what we refer to as the psalmody, uh, or the psalms, it was often referred to generally, the collection of 150 of them, as the praises. Um, and uh, we'll see how that makes sense uh, a little bit later. Um, the psalms are believed to be canonical or inspired by God, uh, by all Christian traditions. Now granted, nowadays we've got so many one-off <laughs> crazy things that who knows what everybody believes. But at least the general... Uh, Protestant uh, denominations and obviously the Catholic Church believes that they're inspired. Um, and also uh, by almost all Jewish traditions. Um, ironically, at the time that Jesus was alive in the first centuries, uh, in the first century, uh, the Sadducees and the Samaritans were groups of Jews that did not tend to believe in the inspired nature of the Psalms. They were just kind of like, tor, tor, tor. You know, the Lord indulges that for a little bit. And so whenever they start lifting off, you know, at him about, oh, well, this isn't the Torah. He's like, well, you know, what did they say in the Torah? There's one example um, uh, where he, uh, talking about the resurrection of the dead, because the Sadducees didn't like that. And he just, he goes back to the Torah. And it's like, you know what? Is, you know, Moses, uh, or is, is uh, uh, Yahweh who spoke to Moses in the burning bush, is he a God of the living or of the dead? He identified himself as the God of your fathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So, um, which is also an important uh, concept uh, for us to keep in mind as we explore any of the Old Testament scriptures. God, from the beginning, intended to reveal uh, his divine son in them. Uh, in various stages as to what humanity can handle at different times, um, as he established and found individuals who were willing to listen to him, and as we're going to see, form various covenants with them. Um, and then in the culmination of the Davidic kingdom and the expression of the Psalms, we get a full-fledged understanding of, uh, or at least a full, the fullest understanding of what the Messiah was going to be before he actually comes to earth. Um, and we know that's the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Um, and then since the time of the church fathers, uh, the Psalms have been considered a summary of the entire Old Testament in one form or another. They give us a comprehensive look at all the different states um, that a soul can have in the presence of God. And so I thought, like, for our next, after these little fun facts, uh, now we'll look at some of the praises, for the praises, as the uh, uh, Israelites refer to the Psalms. Um, so I'm going to just share some quotes from some of the church fathers. Um, so we've got a few from St. Athanasius, who lived from 296 to 373, and he was the Bishop of Alexandria, and uh, he's most known for being a champion of right thinking or orthodoxy um, uh, against the heresy of Arianism. So he argued that the Psalter 
again, as I just mentioned, was basically a synopsis of the whole uh, Bible, an epitome of the whole scriptures, and everything the Bible, everything in the Bible, can be found in some form in the Book of Psalms. Um, now, of course, he's New Testament era, so he's he's suggesting to us that even the content of the New Testament is found in some form in the Psalms. Um, and this is a direct quote from him. It is possible for us, therefore, to find in the Psalter not only the reflection of our own soul state together with precept and example for all possible conditions, but also a fit form of words wherewith to please the Lord on each of life's occasions. Another quote from him, I believe that, man, by the way, this is all from, uh, I think all these quotes are from a letter that he wrote to a spiritual son of his, um, and so you're going to see similar themes, but just a little more detail in each uh, iteration. I believe that a man can find nothing more glorious than these psalms, for they embrace the whole life of man, the affections of his mind, the motions of his soul. To praise and glorify God, he can select a psalm suited to every occasion, and thus will find that they were written for him. Kind of makes me think of the Sabbath. Right? That, you know, the Sabbath was not, uh, we were not created for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was created for uh, the Son of Man. Then the final quote from Athanasius is, is the longest one. They appear to me to be a mirror of the soul of everyone who sings them. They enable him to perceive his own emotions and to express them in the words of the Psalms. He who hears them, he who hears them read, receives them as if they were spoken for him. Conscience struck, he will either humbly repent. Or hearing how the trust of believers was rewarded by God, rejoice as if his mercy were promised to him in particular, and begin to thank God. Yet in its pages, you find portrayed man's whole life, the emotion of his soul, the frames of his mind. We cannot conceive of anything richer than the book of Psalms. If you need patience, if anguish or temptation have befallen you, if you have escaped persecution and oppression or are immersed in deep affliction concerning each and all you may find instruction and state it to God in the words of the Psalter. That is a big statement. That is a very big statement. I think it's important for us to say, like, is that my experience of the Psalms? Um, and then if yes, most of us on the surface, like, you know, I, I think most Christians have read a psalm and felt like it captured some state of their soul. But something that I'll talk about later, we might be able to get. Most of us have also read a psalm and we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Especially the ones that are maybe about Thanksgiving and praise. <laughs> the lament psalms were all like, oh yeah, that's me, I feel that. But, you know, if we as Christians truly embrace the nature of Thanksgiving Psalms, which we're going to be talking about. Um, then Athanasius proceeds to list uh, all the different kinds of emotions and situations in life, and he prescribed different Psalms for them. And that is what is on the back. You have permission to look at it. <laughs> and John Bergman did a wonderful job, or whoever worked with him on his book, of putting together that little <laughs> chart of emotions and emojis, um, and then a list of the Psalms. Uh, that fit each one. So I thought that would be a nice little thing for y'all to have. Um, is that um, uh, you feeling a certain mood or wonder what God uh, has to say to a soul who may be experiencing one of these emotions, we'll just go to that song and, and, and take a look. Um, uh, another uh, 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 saint, uh, Saint Basil the Great, who lived uh, just a little bit after, it kind of overlapped with uh, um, St. Athanasius. Um, he, ironically, they died about the same time, but Basil didn't live as long. He was the bishop of Caesarea. Um, he says the book of Psalms is a compend, which I presume means compendium, of all divinity, a common store of medicine for the soul, a universal magazine of good doctrines profitable to everyone in all conditions. 
Now, I have to admit, when I read this quote, like, my brain went to, ooh, a magazine. Like, <laughs> a glossy, you know, like, like, all kinds of, like, wonderfully presented content, you know? <laughs> and then it hit me, like, no, he probably meant magazine as in, like, you know, the bullets. But, <laughs> um, which is also, you know, <laughs> pretty significant and important. Because do you and I actually see in the Psalms a weapon to fight the spiritual battle that our Lord, that we see St. Paul articulating in the New Testament, is the real and only battle that is definitive, that matters uh, in our lives. And that is the one of truth and lies that are fought by the angels and the the, the fallen angels, the demons. Um, And it's a battle over us and our souls. So St. Basil is saying to us, like, when we feel uh, embattled, worn down, etc., the Psalms, in fact, are where we will find every weapon, every uh, truth, every goodness that we need uh, in order to fight back against the temptations of Satan. And remember, you know, it's so easy to think about the more in-your-face types of ways that Satan attacks souls. Um, uh, but, but normally it's the assaults of lies, deceits, um, about yourself, about your goodness. Um, and he can go both ways. He can make you feel extra funky and unlovable, or he can make you think that you're fine and awesome and you're not. And we have to be careful not to, uh, to, to go to either extreme, but to say, okay, Lord, as I'm reading the Psalms, you know, I don't, I don't feel that lamenty today. <laughs> feel pretty good, etc. But... In faith, we can say, but you know what, Lord? Have I responded with trust? Like I see the psalmist responding um, in, in, in this type of affliction. Uh, did I freak out last time I felt this way? Did I collapse in on myself and sin and console myself with some worldly affection or another? Um, uh, with praise, you know, uh, sometimes I think we as, uh, I'd say as modern Christians, I think it's a modern phenomenon for us to like, scoff and look askance at like somebody else's expression of joy i mean we all can all have envy you know and be upset and think people are being fake but i think it's like the rule of life now you know it's like every child once they you know turn from age like four to five you know like whatever was good for them as kids now it's the most contemptible wicked thing in the world and they ruin it for their siblings um, you know, each generation, you know, you can't even enjoy the humor of the previous generation because only you can roll your eyes and scoff at it. Um, but I think we as Christians sometimes um, can have contempt for a soul that is filled with the praise of God. Ironically, we see that with David. Remember, he was married to, oh, what's her face? Uh, Saul's wife? That's she was? No, 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 that was like yes. Michael. I think Saul's daughter. Saul's daughter. And when he came back with the ark and he was mm-hmm. offering sacrifices, like every however many steps, and then singing praises and dancing around, like, I probably would have thought he was acting like an idiot too. To be <laughs> <laughs> like, chill out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and he would have said to me, <laughs> said to his wife, it's like, okay, well, you know, I've received your contempt, uh, but all the slave girls, you know, are going to think I'm. Wonderful, and not wonderful because I'm the king, but wonderful because I'm actually praising and worshiping God without shame. Um, now that doesn't give us permission to act like idiots, <laughs> but um, you know when we read a psalm that is expressing a joy, a praise, a gratitude, or a thanksgiving that perhaps you and I haven't felt for a while, it's good for us to say, "But you know what, Lord, I'm made for this." And maybe I have a bad attitude and haven't chosen to give you thanks in a while. Uh, maybe I've chosen to abide and think the fullness of my reality is a bunch of negative feelings I've been having, perhaps for real, for some period of time. Like, you know, you can look at your brain waves and like, oh yeah, he feels bad. He is in a funk. She is in a funk. You know, the waves don't fly. But I, being a human person made in the image and likeness of God, can choose to praise God and give him thanks and to abide in the supernatural peace and joy that he's been giving me. So the Psalms, they work as weapons, as protections, as shields, as, uh, uh, as words of praise in so many different ways. Um, and then the last quote I'll share um, is from St. Ambrose, who was the Bishop of Milan. 
uh, who of course uh, in some ways is most famous for being a, a spiritual father and guide to Saint Monica and then also to her son Saint Augustine when he finally uh, began to listen to God and go through his conversion um, and uh, of course we know from Saint Augustine that it was the singing and the chanting of the Psalms uh, especially antiphonally back and forth in the uh, cathedral in uh, Milan under the uh, leadership of St. Ambrose uh, that really just filled his heart and of course that brilliant mind um, and, and helped him to become the saint uh, that we know him to be. But St. Ambrose says the law instructs history informs prophecy predicts correction censures and morals exhort in the book of the Psalms you find the fruit of all of these as well as a remedy for the salvation of the soul. The Psalter deserves to be called the praise of God, the glory of man, the voice of the church, the most beneficial confession of faith. The Psalms teach me to avoid sin and to unlearn my being ashamed of repentance. Let's keep that in mind. To unlearn my being ashamed of repentance. In the Psalms, delight, sorry, in the Psalms, delight and instruction vie with each other. We sing for enjoyment and read for instruction. So we see St. Ambrose laying out an impressive list of the ways that the Psalms uh, transform the heart. And um, I want to, to go back to that teaching to avoid. Uh, Sorry, not the teaching to avoid sin, but unlearning being ashamed of repentance. Uh, when we talk a little bit more in detail about David. Um, now that we kind of have some basic fun facts about the Psalms, we've reflected upon uh, what the church fathers have said. And really, I don't feel like, you know, I'm picking out a handful of saints, but there's so much evidence that the church herself has embraced this attitude. Just in the usage of them in our own public worship and liturgy, and um, you know, I'd be sitting here reading quotes all night if I dug up everything that every saint has ever said about the Psalms. So uh, we're going to take them as kind of instructive and as authoritative there. Um, before we get into some other details about the Psalms, I figured, and again, I'm stealing this from Bird's Wing. Uh, I want to introduce the Psalms the way that the Psalms introduce themselves. So let's take a look at the first Psalm and the second Psalm, which are considered to be introductory Psalms to Book 1 um, of the Psalter. Right? Um, is there someone who would uh, be willing to read Psalm 1 loudly? <laughs> Dennis? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, the way of the wicked will perish. And then can someone else read for me the second song? Okay. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. 
with trembling kiss his feet, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Before we uh, go any further, um, can anyone, does anyone see, um, I guess, a difference between these two songs? Uh, what do you notice about them? Are they similar in any way? Um, do you see something that's distinct about them? We'll, we'll get into it, so nobody has an answer this far. Dennis? Well, there's a comparison between the wicked on one side and the good on the other. Okay. So we see that in the first song. Anything else? You see a prophecy of uh, the Messiah. Okay, very good. So in the second song, uh, we see, as Ed said, the prophecy of the Messiah. It's about a king and his kingdom. The first psalm is about wisdom, following you know God and His ways as opposed to the ways of the, the wicked. And so, um, Bergsma points out, I think quite rightly, uh, that we have in the Psalter itself that collection of 150 psalms an introduction that is twofold and gives us uh, a basic kind of. Uh, Yes, two distinct ways or things that we can look at in the Psalter. Um, in the first one, we have what is referred to as an introduction to the wisdom aspect of the Psalter. In other words, God's law is the heart of wisdom, God's way of life. Uh, uh, the world's way, uh, God's way leads to life, uh, the world's way leads to death. Um, in these types of Psalms, we're going to see promises of blessings and favor on the one who meditates on God's law and follows his path. However, most of the songs, and even though they're about law and about wisdom, um, they actually don't contain laws the way that like, the book of Deuteronomy does or, or even are articulated in Exodus. Um, and they also don't include instruction in the way that the Proverbs or the other wisdom literature communicates wisdom and instruction. Um, so how then is it that these psalms are about wisdom and about the law? Um, and the answer is that the psalms reveal to us that God's law is fundamentally about worship and prayer. Um, it is about being in right relationship with God, um, by extension with one another. Um, and so uh, the aspect of, of the Psalms that communicates to us God's law and his wisdom in a very particular way is about prayer, worship, and being in relationship with him. Um, now the other aspect of the Psalter, which uh, we pointed out, is about the kingdom. In particular, the Davidic kingdom. Uh, 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 then prophetically about how that kingdom is going to be fulfilled perfectly in the Messiah who we know to be Jesus Christ uh, the son of David the son of man but also the son of God and in these types of songs we see how to live a life in your relationship with God from the perspective of one who is living that relationship with God uh, David shares his own life with us and gives us a model. Um, so we see uh, the life, the habits, uh, the virtues uh, of the wise and righteous man. Now, of course, one of the things that we know about David is that he is also a man that had to repent. He had to repent of some pretty grave sins. And I think that's why St. Basil points out, or St. Basil um, points out, in reading the Psalms and encountering David, the righteous man, the man after the Lord's own heart, who lived in relationship with him, we also then learn how to overcome our shame about repentance. When we live in a culture that will point fingers and blame and accuse and 
and everybody and their brother to deny it, ever having done anything wrong. Because you know what? If you ever did anything wrong, they're going to dig it up, especially if you're 30 and under and never had a wife on the internet. They're going to dig it up and throw it in your face. And unless you agree with their doctrine and orthodoxy, you will not be forgiven. And as Christians, we have to be careful not to fall into that most hateful and pernicious and wicked of worldly demonic mindsets of blame and accusation of others and of ourselves that does not allow us to be truly transformed and move beyond our sins. And there is something left to ourselves uh, that is truly scandalous about David being a man after the Lord's own heart. Think about it. Not only did he laze around while his men were out fighting battles, He's on top of the roof looking out. He sees a naked woman that is not his wife because she paid him. It's not like she's out there being all nasty and modern. <laughs> <laughs> I presume she's out there actually really taking a bath. Um, he sees her, takes her for his own, commits adultery because he actually has a real wife, and then he kills her husband. This is grave, 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 especially for a man who has been anointed. Still with the Holy Spirit in a way that is very unique at that point in the future. I mean, we don't get that in the normal way until Christ and the church. You have some of the prophets that clearly had an outflow of the Spirit, Moses, and then the elders, as we saw in our reading for the well, not this much today, probably can't call the mess yet, but as we see in our first reading uh, uh, for this Sunday, um, uh, and David rejects that in an intense way for somebody who has been blessed so much at that point in his life. But then we see how David repents and returns to his heavenly father. And we also see how God receives David. And I forget what psalm we have. I have to look at the word right here for details. But, you know, he said, I was punished. I was punished by the Lord, but not doomed to die. Do you and I have that type of attitude. Are we so trusting in the Lord that we will turn to him confident in his willingness to forgive us, confident that his punishments are right and just, confident that he is not going to crush us with any punishments, and confident that he is going to restore us to union with him? And then especially for us as Christians, which they, you know, David did not have this except in to whatever degree he had a prophetic sense what was coming, we are going to be raised to a life of divine union with God. Overcoming our shame about repentance is very, very important. And you and I should not overestimate our fallen inclination to justify ourselves. It's good old school self-righteousness. And it exists in it exists in all its fullness and glory, ironically, amongst the irreligious atheistic uh, uh, mindset of today's world. It's crazy to me when I see, you know, you think like, oh, as soon as you abandon a, a God and the culture, that you know, self-righteousness, you know, that's a religious thing, especially in Christian. You know, Christians are the worst self-righteous people. You know, if you're a Christian now, you might as well be a Pharisee. But the truth is, you don't see self-righteousness in its full ugliness until you get the culture of secular humanism that's coming around. And it will tear each other apart. You know, the different factions and whatnot. You and I as Christians have to be prepared. Are we going to be like Christ? And let it tear us apart, knowing that Christ will deliver us. And that if we cooperate with him, we can participate in bringing about a redemption of this viciousness. And if it weren't for his grace, you and I would be a part of ourselves. So, um, I guess I'm jumping ahead of my night and he was jumping ahead. It's like, we're going to see that all these things that David shares, you and I, to some degree or another, are going to experience. Not in the exact same way. But we see that even saintly souls who were saintly from early in their youth go through tremendous affliction. They consider themselves saying, look at St. Therese, never even committed a mortal sin, and yet was convinced to be the most wicked of sinners. Um, this uh, life of, of union, struggle, reconciliation, etc. 
is the way of the Christian. And we have to make our peace with it and let our Lord instruct us and guide us and deliver us. Um, so when we think about these first two psalms, uh, I think Psalm 1 is an introduction uh, really to the, the, the way of wisdom. And the second psalm is an introduction to uh, the, the royal aspect, the, the, the king. And I also want to mention it's in, I think it's in the last line of the one, um, of Psalm 2, um, uh, talking about God, lest he be angry and you perish uh, in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So taking refuge in the king who is united to God is a very important dynamic in the Psalms. And of course, for us as Christians, we realize that yeah, we take we take so profound a refuge in Christ, the King of the universe, who we're actually members of his body. We truly abide in him and he abides in us. Um, so um, that's uh, you know, kind of an overall introduction to the Psalms. So whenever you approach the Psalms, uh, one of the first distinctions you can make as you're reading one is like, okay, is this kind of an, an instructive wisdom crazy prairie worshiping song <laughs> or is this one about the kingdom now they're all kind of about the kingdom and they're all kind of crazy and worshipy and prairie uh, but um, you're, you're going to see these these kind of different lines uh, or distinctions uh, um, that are going to form now at first I wasn't going to get too much into this but, but I do think it, it helps um to have, especially if you're like me, and don't, some people have like an inclination to literature, and they, they, they just see patterns and forms and little, I don't know, little devices and things like that. I'm just like, you know, I read, I, like if, I would have struggled with this, the question I asked y'all. I read these two Psalms, I'm like, I don't know, it's the Psalms. <laughs> They're the Psalms. <laughs> kind of like, what is love? <laughs> it's good, I don't know. <laughs> it's like some things are so feel so obvious to us like we can't make a distinction uh, but of course as we dig into the scriptures we recognize well if each psalm is inspired there's a reason God wanted all 150 of them to be revealed for our salvation um, and so it's important for us to, to, uh, to do our best to try and see the nuances the distinctions what God is drawing out in the different uh even literary forms uh, that the scriptures take place. Um, so um, I'm going to throw out there that, uh, and I think I already mentioned this, that the Psalms are poetry. They are not um, prose in any sense of the word. They, they are poetry. Um, okay. All right. It's on the wrong page. Um, as such, uh, we need to reflect on what kind of poetry, what's what's the form. Um, if you're like me and relatively ignorant of these things, I think poetry, rhyming. <laughs> Sing songy rhymes, you know. And you read the Psalms, you're like, oh, they don't rhyme. <laughs> I don't see, I don't know how to make a sing song either, to be honest. <laughs> they don't. They don't fit. The, you know the, the music formation I received in the seventies and eighties. Um, <laughs> at least I don't know how to cram them into that. I think some liturgical musicians have tried, and I think they failed. But anyway. um, so, how is it poetry? Well, kind of the main poetic aspect you're going to see is that they are uh, two or three lines. Put together that manifest what's called a parallelism, parallelism of thought. Um, I'm also going to throw out that um, even though they, they don't rhyme, it is believed that they have what is called, I think, meter, yes, um, uh, or rhythm, but we don't actually know what that is. There's no real scholarly consensus. Um, I've read some compelling things that suggest that the earliest forms of chant in the church that we know are more than likely the closest thing to what it was like in ancient times when they would sing the psalms in the, uh, uh, the temple. Um, you know, because we got it from somewhere. You know, uh, in general, the church just doesn't come up with stuff. I think they tried that in the 60s. But, uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, 
uh, but the kind of the, the poetic things we're going to be looking for are these what they're called colas or lines that most commonly are grouped in twos and sometimes are grouped in threes and every once in a while there'll be one that stands alone. Um, uh, again, these are called colas, bicolas, or tricolas. Um, and uh, uh, again, the bicola is the most common one in the Psalter. When you see three lines together or a tricola, that tends to be used to slow down the flow and to give that thought or idea a kind of a solemn, you know, pay attention to this, a more solemn feel. Um, there tends to be three forms of parallelism, parallelism that are, can be recognized in these uh, uh, bicolas. Um, and they are synonymous parallelism, parallelism, antithetical parallelism, and synthetic parallelism. All right, I'm just trying to give you those names. <laughs> I'll explain what they mean. And I think once you get these concepts, you'll, you'll kind of recognize. You might not remember synthetic parallelism antithetical, um, I won't. Uh, but you'll see the patterns and the, the concept, the idea. Um, now the examples that I'm using are actually from the Psalms that I gave you on the page, and so I'll tell you. Uh, so we're going to look at Psalm 2 verse 1. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? So that is what is called a synonymous parallelism. That is when each line of the bicola expresses the same meaning in two different ways. So you've got the nations conspiring, and you've got the peoples plotting in vain. So, see that there. All right, the next one is from Psalm 1, verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of righteousness, but the way of the wicked will perish. All right, we see that contrast that Dennis pointed out in the first Psalm when we read that, the way of the wicked uh, versus the way of righteousness. Um, so an antithetical parallelism is when the idea or meaning of the first line of the bipolar is contrasted or inverted in the second. So, right? so you can either have the same thought manifested in two different ways or two contrasted uh, thoughts. And then we have um, what's called synthetic parallelism. And you can take a look at Psalm 2 verse 6. I have set my king on Zion, my, I have set my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Now that is the synthetic parallel, parallelism is when the second line of the bipola expands, completes, or further illuminates the first line. Um, there are subcategories of synthetic parallelisms, but I just don't want to. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> um, by the way, when you start looking at these things on the Psalms, it, it's like, oh my God, like, you kind of had to make up your mind. What do I need right now to help me dive deeper? And so I guess I did a little bit of that work for y'all as I put this together. Um, but you don't want to get lost, you know, in the, the details and kind of miss the point. Um, so, so my point here was to just introduce you to some basic, uh, the, the most regular and normal forms. Uh, again, there are other devices. Um, uh, there are slight variations here and there throughout the scripture or throughout the Psalms, um, but these are the patterns uh, that have been established and are, are kind of easily agreed upon and recognizable. Um, and so again, you're looking at when I'm going to read a Psalm, I can expect to see some bipolar, <laughs> these little two line thingies that are expressing uh, uh, the same idea contrasting idea or the initial idea being completed by the second, all right? And then the variations are one standing alone uh, and then three that kind of gives a more solemn, solemn vibe to, to uh, what you're reading, all right? Now, as far as the types of songs or the literary genres, there are six basic types. So at the beginning with these two introductory songs, we established that there's generally speaking Psalms that have to do with wisdom, law, prayer, worshiping things. And then there's ones that have to do with the Davidic king, David himself, the Davidic kingdom. Um, so now we're going to get into six categories that are a little more distinct. Um, 
And some of these, I think you're going to recognize, like, oh, yeah, I've seen that. I see, I see that in, in my reading of the Psalms. Um, the first is, of the six types, is lament psalms. So I hope this is familiar with, to you because these are the most common. I think these are the ones that we must identify with. <laughs> you know, because these are the ones where you're crying out to God. You have some petition. You're wanting him to come to your aid for some reason. Um, there's illness, false accusation, persecution, some combo of the, some other distress that one is under. Um, and then the subdistinction for a lament psalm is it can either be personal or communal. So you can have David crying out because often I think the majority of the lament psalms are, or at least of the personal lament psalms, are David fleeing persecution. And of course, that's the first aspect of his life where Saul's after him. You know, because it's pretty clear that Saul is not that awesome. <laughs> and that David is actually being obedient to God and is receiving favors from him. And Saul gets envious and jealous and starts persecuting David. Um, and then the communal laments are the ones where the entire people of Israel are crying out because um, perhaps most commonly uh, they've been banished and exiled in Babylon. All right? um, the second type of psalm is called the Thanksgiving or Tadah or Tadah uh, psalms. That's T O D A H. Um, these are psalms that are acts of gratitude and praise to God in response to his help and deliverance in very particular circumstances. Um, they can also be individual or communal in nature. So you can have David giving thanks for having been delivered uh, from Saul's grasp and its enemies in this particular situation, or the people of Israel very particularly expressing gratitude for deliverance from this um, uh, particular uh, trial that they're undergoing. Um, hold this theme in your mind, thanksgiving to God. Um, uh, this is really characteristic of David, uh, his attitude and approach to God. Um, the third genre or type is what we would just refer to as hymns. These are also thanksgiving and praise in nature, but they're more general than the Tada Psalms. Um, uh, in other words, they focus on God's innate attributes, his goodness, his awesomeness, all powerfulness, his truth, his love. Um, and um, uh, to kind of drive home the point uh, that the entirety of the Psalter should be kind of reflected upon in this aspect of like God is awesome and wonderful and good and trustworthy. The last five Psalms of the Psalter are all hymns of praise. Uh, they're just general, just God is awesome. Even if there is no particular uh, thing that we're going to talk about, that his goodness is just manifest and obvious, and we delight in it. Um, the fourth kind of literary genre are um, uh, what we call the royal psalms. Um, these focus on the person of the king, David himself, the, generally speaking, the son of David, um, or his, his kingdom. Um, and they are offering praise to God's power and fidelity shown through the king, or they are psalms that are praying for the king, um, uh, or offering petition on his behalf. Um, they certainly refer to David uh, and his heirs, but all these royal psalms also point beyond themselves to an age of salvation that remains in the future, at least at the time that these psalms were inspired and written. Um, and it must be fulfilled definitively in the descendant of the son of David who is to come and who we identify, and the Jews identified as the Messiah, the promised one, and who we know to be Jesus Christ, the incarnate son of God. So he's son of man, son of David, son of God. All right? Uh, the fifth type, so we've got lament and thanksgiving, so you can put those together. And then the hymns flow from the Thanksgiving and are just more general. Now we kind of got the royal psalms. Um, and then uh, a little more specifically, but connected to the royal psalms, are what we call Mount Zion psalms. Um, uh, but these in particular focus on the glories of the holy city, Jerusalem. 
which was the seat of the Davidic kingdom and the site of the temple where the sacrifices were offered. Um, these types of psalms do often overlap with other categories. Um, and what we want to remember about Mount Zion, this is one of these things that early in my time was like Mount Zion. I just feel like people, you know, I grew up in rural country with like Mount Zion Baptist Church. I'm like, I didn't know what that meant. I don't think they did it. <laughs> you know, it's like we hear these words, Mount Zion. It is you know, the mountain where uh, uh, the temple was, and more significantly for us, it's where the Davidic covenant was established. Uh, I'm not going to have time to get into it tonight, but when you hear the word covenant, you think of God establishing a familial exchange relationship union with some representative of mankind on a mountain. <laughs> so when you get covenant, you got a person, God, and a mountain. <laughs> and the reason for that is salvation. <laughs> so we got Adam and Noah and then Abraham, uh, Moses, which is really kind of a like, okay, this is a temporary thing because y'all awful. <laughs> and then David, <laughs> and then of course Jesus Christ on Mount Calvary. Which I think they think might be uh, Mariah. Right, that, that's one of those fun words. Uh -huh. We'll get to heaven and find out what it's supposed to be. It's like, no, it's just somebody that went out. Um, but anyway, it'd be cool if it was awesome. Um, so, again, uh, uh, Mount Zion is the place uh, of the revelation of the Davidic covenant. Um, uh, just as Mount Sinai was the place of the, Mosaic, the revelation of the Mosaic covenant. Um, and this can, can be considered Mount Zion the apex of all the covenants that were established in the Old Testament. Um, and we're pointing to and preparing for the definitive covenant that would be established and ratified in Jesus Christ. And then the sixth category is the wisdom or uh, Torah psalms, um, which are more specifically like the first psalm that we read, just about God's law um, and, and how to live a righteous life. Um, and that can overlap with others too. So as you're encountering these, you don't want to be too definitive and be like, this is a real psalm. And like getting arguments with your friend, you know, it's like no, it, they can overlap. But generally speaking, one or the it's going to be identifiable as one or another of these. Um, hopefully, y'all have recognized some general themes about these songs. There's a lot about David. There's a lot about the kingdom. So as we jump into a few details about who wrote the songs, that is going to be vitally important for how we interpret how to worship with them. Um, so who wrote the songs? The simple answer is very unsatisfying to modern scholars who just want to run a man like David. Whether we as Catholic, who wrote the song David? He wrote about 70 or 80 of them, which is half. All right, David wrote them. Um, about 12 were written by an ancient Israelite choir established by David, referred to as the Sons of Korah. So when you come across that weird expression, Sons of Korah, it's like, okay, that's the ancient Israelite choir established by David. Sing the songs. <laughs> and they wrote 12 of them. Um, uh, there's actually a couple of the names of the Sons of Korah that are, that are mentioned uh, in the scriptures as well. Um, another about a dozen were written by a choir leader appointed by David named Asaph, A-S-A-P-H. All right? Solomon wrote one. And there's another one about Solomon. Moses wrote one. So that's kind of the outlier <laughs> there. Moses wrote one of the Psalms. And I was dumb and didn't write down which one. <laughs> so that would be kind of cool to know. Um, and then the others are anonymous and were written long after David's time. Um, uh, In Psalm 90. Psalm 90 is the one written by Moses. Um, Others are all written long after David's time, um, uh, and most of them seem to have been uh, written uh, at the time when the Judeans were taken uh, into captivity in Babylon, and in the time that they returned to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So, when you think of the Psalter, <clears throat> you think David and his kingdom. David wrote them, his people wrote them, and then the people who wrote them later wrote them in that spirit. Um, 
the ones that come from the the Aaron battle. So David, 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 David. Jesus, 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 son of David, son of David, son of David, right? Exalted, right? Um, This is important for us as Christians to remember because David and his kingdom are way more significant to properly understanding the Old Testament as a whole and how it prepares and leads into the New Testament than, I I don't want to say than we realize, than we subconsciously acknowledge. Because what do people think about when you say the Old Testament? What's going to come to mind? Genesis, Exodus. And more particularly, what's what's in Exodus especially? Moses, oh, yes. oh, Ten Commandments. Well, we got big old movies. You know, that, that's, you know, <laughs> heck, even at the time of Jesus, it seems that all the the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the scribes, it's like Moses, Moses, Moses. We're going to use Moses to attack you, Jesus, son of David. <laughs> you know, they're just, you know, sacrifices and you know all this nitpicky stuff. Some of which God had told them to do, um, but they failed to understand why He had told them to do it. King David understood more fully why God had told him to offer those sacrifices um, uh, than, than the people at the time uh, who were alive, the Israelites who were the Jews who were alive at the, alive at the time of Christ. Um, and I think often we too think of that Ten Commandments, Moses, etc. But as I started out with these kind of fun facts that are actually kind of useful, it is the Psalms that are most quoted in the New Testament. It's the psalms that are most utilized in our our liturgy. It is the psalms and King David who radically, I don't want to say changed, but brought to a more perfect fulfillment even what the Mosaic Covenant, which was always meant to be temporary, and it was one of those covenants that basically God established. All those other ones were, even if you fail, I'm going to fulfill it. Mosaic Covenant was not like that. It's like, I'm going to do this if you do this, but if you don't, woe to you. It was clear. It was emphatic that that's what it was. You remember that little incident where uh, Joshua was like, okay, me and my household, we're doing it. But you people decide. And if you don't want to, take a hike now and go figure out who you're going to worship. You going to go worship the gods beyond the river or whatever, where your ancestors were from. You can go over here and worship these pagan gods, but me and my people are going to worship this God who has revealed these things to us. Um, so in David, you see that God had always intended even the more nitpicky, minutiae type of things of the Mosaic Covenant, which, by the way, were given to the people of Israel. Why? Because they were rebellious and disobedient. It always had an instructive, corrective, disciplinary type of vibe to it. And when that was going to be fulfilled perfectly, and who did that? Christ. It was going to give way to this more perfect mode of praise that we see foreshadowed in David and his approach and his attitude towards God, which was living in intimate, heart-to-heart relationship with him, praising him, thanking him, crying out to him, sometimes needing to repent mightily hateful, selfish infractions, but trusting that God was going to do it. We see in David, in a sense, of fulfillment um, to a degree that was going to that uh, was kind of a prophetic sign of the perfection we were going to see in Christ. Um, and so understanding David's role in salvation history is how we see the Psalms' role in salvation history how we see this connection. Now for us as Catholics, if we're getting close to time here, um, I'm going to presume kind of just a fundamental basic understanding of like, okay, you have the covenant with Adam, does the covenant with Noah, uh, then Abraham, uh, the Mosaic thing is kind of like, oh my gosh, it's like, you know, what do you call it, triage? <laughs> you know, band-aids and stuff like that. Um, I mean, more significant than band-aids. But then the Davidic covenant, um, which is, I am going to promise that your kingdom will last forever. All right? One of your descendants is going to be the prophet who was 
after the you know like Moses that Moses prophesied you know way back in the day um, that he is going to be the fulfillment of all the promises to Abraham uh, and he is going to be the fulfillment of my promises to you and he is truly going to be a king he is going to reign all nations are going to take refuge in him and he's going to reconcile all with God um, and then the whole world is going to be capable of now offering perfect praise and thanksgiving to God. And we know that that takes place uh, uh, in its hidden but perfect form right up there. The Mass. Thanksgiving. Eucharist. Um, you've got the bread from heaven. You've got the perfection of the, the mosaic sacrifices. Um, uh, the, the slaughtering of the Lamb. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world who's perfect. All these covenants come together in their perfection in Jesus Christ but what is the most significant aspect that we are meant to live in and rest in and by the way you can't ignore the other stuff you know, that's what we said. it was Thanksgiving and praise that doesn't mean run around like just running your mouth and Thanksgiving and praying it's like okay sometimes things are awful <laughs> and that's why there's Psalms where you know, some of the Psalms end and you can like oh I'm glad this isn't the only Psalm <laughs> Because <laughs> I got to read the next one or a few months down to realize, oh, things are going to be okay. But that's also true of Jesus, right? Because a lot of the prophecies of the Psalms, it's like, yeah, David got persecuted and stuff like that, but Jesus really gets persecuted and rejected. He is king, he is sinless, and yet the world does not want to take refuge in him. And they reject him, they crucify him, uh, but then he rises from. He conquers and reigns not through an expression of, 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 of brute force, but of empowering each of us now to offer perfect praise to God through our union with his heir, Jesus Christ. Um, uh, who, being members of his body, which is affected through the sacrifice of Thanksgiving and the Eucharist, now we are able to participate in that. But because we're not yet perfect, all these other ups and downs and dramas and all this kind of stuff that get expressed in the Psalms, you and I are going to go through that. We have to make our peace with that. And some of us are going to be tempted like, oh, I must be favored by God because my life is so awesome. Others of us like, oh my God, I can always be hated by God because my life is so horrible. <laughs> no. Every last one of us is objectively loved by God whether we feel it or not. <laughs> and we have to do our best to embrace what is expressed in the song and say, Lord, you know what? I don't know that I know what that feels like right now, the positive stuff. But it's true, it's good, and I'm going to experience that in its felt, glorified perfection at some point, and I will probably taste it in the here and now in some form or another. Help me not to lament too much enough to separate myself from you that I'm not experiencing it the way that I want now. And then, if things are easy and gentle and wonderful I hope we don't be like somebody like St. Therese it's like you know what I needed this kind of easy protected wonderful little garden otherwise I would be so wicked you couldn't even enter me so kind of a weird way to end it but anyway <laughs> <laughs> any questions I have, I have two questions okay. about two different psalms and both of the psalms I'm going to reference are really short okay uh, have these who questions knows I'm going to be able to answer for over because. okay <laughs> So, something that has always puzzled me so much is the third song that is the standby for Sunday 1 in the Liturgy of Hours. Okay, so it's one of these, it's, it's Psalm 149, and it's subtitles like, The Joy of God's Holy People. And it begins, like, these other, right, like... Real quick, yeah. it's Psalm 149, yeah. which is one of the last five in the Psalter, which means it's there a go. hymn. But how it's about a crazy, that? worshiping, general, <laughs> God is awesome song. Yeah, it's a God is awesome song, right? And it, the way it begins is just like that. Sing a new song to the Lord, His praise in the assembly of the faithful, blah, 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 blah. Let Israel rejoice in its maker. And then it gets dark really fast. <laughs> Let the praise of God be on their lips and a two-edged sword in their hand to deal out vengeance to the nations and punishment on all the peoples, to bind their kings in chains and their nobles in fetters of iron, to carry out the sentence preordained. This honor is for all his faithful. And I've just never understood. <laughs> like, even if that song exists, 
Why would it be in well, Sunday one? Like, I will, I will the do, set of songs most often prayed. Like, I will do my best to give a concise and brief answer. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to say, first of all, I think we have a whole book of the New Testament scriptures to help us understand that in Revelation. Um, and we see this tension um, that God's enemies, his true enemies, his real enemies, will be put asunder. Jesus, the Son of God, who the book of Revelation is going to be the woman born, the, 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 the child born of the woman, going to rule with an iron bottle, you know, double-edged sword that pierces the heart, you know, all these kinds of things are part of our imagery. Um, there will be no eternal joy in lest the enemies of God, who are those angelic and or human persons who hate him and anybody who loves him, unless they are definitively separated and get what they want and are punished, which I, weirdly enough is hell. But you know, that selfishness is hell. That's what it is. Um, so what the reason that this is not gloating and taking kind of an inappropriate joy in the destruction of our enemies is you and I are tempted by our real enemy to think that each other is our real enemy. Huh. So in other words, let's put this in you know, modern. And I do not want to get political. I'm going to use political things. I don't want to. It's just like, you know what? Republicans going to read that song and think all the Democrats going to be wiped out. Democrat going to read that and think all the Republicans going to be wiped out. <laughs> you know, if you got racial bigotry issues, you're going to think, oh, then all the white people are going to be wiped out. And we got that going on. You know, or all the black people going to be able to say, okay, stop it. Or all the Chinese, all the communists, all the capitalists, all, you know, stop it. Who is our real enemy? Satan. Satan. From the beginning. The father of lies. He and his fallen angels are the ones that you and I know definitively hate God and are still awaiting the perfection of their punishment. I mean, they're pretty miserable now, <laughs> as it is, but they are going to be definitively punished and separated from dealing with any of God's people. He is permitting us to be tested at this point. You and I know that it's in the realm of God's goodness and righteousness that human persons created in his image and likeness who do not want to abide in relationship with him, he will ultimately honor that and let them go their own way and be separated from him. So we know it's possible that some of us will align ourselves against God forever, but you and I are blessed beyond measure to never have any definitive knowledge of who that enemy that is why the Psalms often, uh, we didn't get into the, what is it, the deprecatory Psalms, you know, like dashing your enemy's infants and babies on their heads and all this kind of stuff. It's like, oh my God. Well, if you think about the fruit of Satan, you know, his, his uh, you've got the, uh, the, the proto evangelium in Genesis. So, um, you know, uh, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, between her seed and your seed, and her seed will crush you. Your head. All right. Well, what's the seed of Satan? That's going to be whoever us chooses to abide in lies and in selfishness and eternally separate ourselves. And you know what? Our heads deserve to be bashed against the box if that's what's going to happen. Which ain't the worst thing that's going to, we're going to experience. But you and I don't know who that is. And what we see in Christ who hangs on the cross, I know the chap is up, I want to point behind my nose, crucifix is white up there. You can't see it. The Trinity icon here. But the Christ who hangs on the cross shows us what that triumph looks like, this side of his return again in glory. And you and I will not take a fallen delight. Like, it's hard for us to imagine what kind of an authentic, righteous, holy joy will look like in the face of the destruction of God's enemies. But I think the key to understanding is, like, we will have already suffered and lamented to the degree that we are willing to cooperate with Christ, who suffered it perfectly, the full pain and sorrow of the rejection of God. And that is why you and I have to fight diligently against movements of anger, not act like it's not there, because then it gets repressed and it comes out in funky ways. 
Americans. <laughs> it normally is directed at the wrong people because um, we barely direct it directly at Satan. Yeah. You're the reason. <laughs> you know, for what? That I'm horrible? No, not actually. Um, so I think that's where you get this tension. It's like we want to look forward to the return of Christ and to his triumph and glory. And part of that is going to be the definitive destruction and separation of his enemies from the righteous, where they will no longer be able to cause pain or sorrow and tears. But we know that he has done everything, pouring his life out, giving his resurrected body for spiritual food, and you and I will not get to witness the destruction of our enemies in that perfect sense until we are able to witness it the way God does having ourselves been moved in some way or another in our experience of the cross. So that's how I, and you and I think we have to be so careful because even, and we, we, we all cheat when we get away. We got our little villains throughout history. You know, they're like, oh yeah, I don't have to act like, you know, Jesus didn't die for him. Jesus didn't die for Genghis Khan. You know, pick whoever it is. And I'm like, mm, no, we don't get to do that. And uh, you and I have to be prepared to be humble that there might be some horrible sinners in heaven who have repented like David and have a higher place than you or I who didn't do anything like that. As far as I know, I haven't killed, well, I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> you know, murdered anyone. You know, like, you never know we're going to find out. It's like, you know what? When you ran your mouth and destroyed their reputation, it was worse than killing them. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, but that's we see the saints resting in that. I, I, I in my own way, could have been the most guilty of sinners. I, I don't know with Saint Francis, it's hard to know what stories are apocryphal and what are not. Um, we'll stick with uh, Saint Bonaventure's uh, account of his life, but there, there's a there was a story that there was a prophecy that, that some spiritual woman received that on Saint Francis's birthday, um, he knew this after the fact that. One of the most holy men who ever lived was going to be born, and one of the most wicked men who ever lived was going to be born. And so, when the history kind of looks back, like, oh, well, the most holy man, and one of the most holy men ever, that's clearly St. Francis, but who's the most wicked person? You know, we didn't have no, you know, Hitler or, you know, Stalin or somebody like that coming from Assisi in that time. And the thought was like, oh, it could have been forever, St. Francis. Like, if he had rejected the all those graces that God had given him, he could have been one of the most horrific, wicked men who ever lived. That doesn't mean he would have had the type of wickedness that would have tried to conquer the world. It might have been the more gross and banal and lukewarm kind that we tend to share in any modern culture. <laughs> um, in the same way that Our Lady, if she had rejected the grace, the fullness of redemption that Christ offered her and was given to her in the Immaculate Conception, if she had rejected that later, there would be a sense in which she would be more evil and horrific than Satan. We don't tend to think like that, you know, but, but it's true. What, uh, uh, yeah, another, so second question. Oh my gosh. Is, is the song, I, I just can't, uh, I've just never figured out how you're supposed to pray with this one. And every time I come across, I'm just like, all right. And I, I like flip the page. Um, it's Psalm 131. And anyone who knows me will know why it's hard for me to pray for this moment. I'll start reading it. Lord, my heart is not proud, nor are my eyes haughty. I do not busy myself with great matters, with things too sublime for me. So the way you're supposed to read that is, Jesus, this is clearly not me yet. Yeah. But. I'm just like, who's ever able holy, to have a sympathetic reading I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to express those sympathies. Yeah, I just find that so hard. Like. And that, that's as far as I get. Yeah. Every time I read that psalm, I'm like, okay. It's like a little via negativa moment. And I'm like, okay, it's, Lord, it's, I can't I can't honestly meant, say those words. It's and that's meant it. to humble us. And even I would think that the most righteous of saints reading that psalm mm -hmm. before they pass from this life to the next is going to have a similar response. Mm -hmm. This is not me yet. Lord knows. It's probably something to aspire to. Exactly. An expression of the will. So this is my will for my. Exactly. Want to be well, the hard thing is what I read is over half of the psalm. 
I mean, it's this tiny little song, yeah, so there's but... nothing else to it. Like, that's all he's right. saying. He's like, just a quick song to say I'm not proud or haughty. <laughs> Bye. Well, remember, though, <laughs> we often have to contend with the fact that we can, we know that in one way, but then in our behavior, we kind of act like we're righteous and not proud and not haughty. Because, you know, when we say something proud, before we repented of it, we, ooh, that's righteous. Otherwise, why would, I have, why would I have said it if it wasn't true? You know, so again, I think the songs, uh, going back to um, the praises of the praises that the saints say, we can find in this reflections of our current temperament, what our temperament or disposition ought to be, what it might be further along in the spiritual life, what we, you know, we read it like, Lord, this is not me. And this is why I need to read it. This is not me. And you make yourself read it. <laughs> like Jesus. That's what I feel like with some of the songs, yeah, and those songs where some of them are talking about like, oh, how innocent and how clean I am. Like, oh, I, I, I can't connect to it. But I have not. I mean, one day, Lord. I have not. 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 I have saying this to God as part of the yes. prayer of the church when it's yes. like it's not me yeah. it, it, it feels like a this. little embarrassing like I can't believe I'm saying these words it's like <laughs> yeah. I have not Let walked from humble. your way well, what does St. Basil say it's like you've got to <laughs> overcome your shame Over, like Lord this is not mm-hmm. true right now and yet it's possible like when the Lord mm-hmm. says be perfect as my Father in Heaven is perfect mm-hmm. well, we're so anxious and wear ourselves trying to be perfect according to all kinds of dumb standards mm-hmm. And yet, the only way we're actually capable of being perfect is having a pure heart, a clean heart, because the Lord wills to purify us over time. Uh, one last question. 150 Psalms. Uh, how come I they're not, numbered differently yeah, depending I, on your translation of the Bible? I, for some reason, my brain, I'm just like, you know what, I don't care. I've read it before. There's an answer out there, but you know, I knew somebody was going to ask me that. I'm like, you know what? There's some, there's some weird reason. I don't know. Okay. There, there's always some good apologetic scholarly explanation for those types of things. And like I said, I've read it before. I'm like, okay, that's good enough for me. But I've got this head. Thank you for proving I'm a prophet. <laughs> And of course, the, that came to me as it was like five till seven. I'm like, I don't even have time to reread them. <laughs> um, and I will, I will leave you with this little insight too. We didn't get to get to it, but um, in the Bergsma book, he lays out how I think this is pitiful. I forget there are five books of the Psalms, right? There's five mm-hmm. big categories. Um, they're not all evenly dispersed. I think the first book is maybe the biggest, but. Um, the general pattern that they follow is the life of David. So like, well, I'm being chased and persecuted by Saul. Okay, I'm fine. Oh, I'm not really, you know, dipping back down. Like, and he's got these little drawings and charts that are helpful to show you how the different books, by the concentration of psalms that are in them, show you this general up and down. But almost if by design, you know, because God has a way of inspiring people, the Psalter itself is put together with exceptions in each of those books. And so like even at the beginning, it's like it's clear to most scholars, like these two Psalms are clearly meant to be introductions to the whole Psalter. Um, or, oh, look, they put a, a group of five hymn praise songs at the end. Um, uh, or um, as you're talking about this phase, and you know, it's kind of on, on the downside by the people that are in Babylon in exile. Oh, but there's there's a hymn of praise thrown in there. Uh, there's something about the, you know the king being thrown in there, but but it, it's interesting if you get into that or are intrigued um, by the patterns. There are general patterns that can be recognized, but there, there's exceptions. Um, and I will say too, um, as you pray the psalms, and we already touched this a little bit of this when I responded to Ben's question, like in some ways. Because it's all about establishing a relationship of gratitude and praise with God, you come across a psalm that rebukes you, that chastens you. One of the saints said, it pricks your conscience. It's like, I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed. This this is not me. Well, it should be. And more importantly, it can be if I let Jesus love me out of my pride, out of my mouth, out of my, you know, whatever it is that's keeping me from him. 
Um, and so, um, you know, no matter what psalm you're reading, you can either look at that little list that St. Athanasius gave us and pick one that fits your mood, but sometimes it's good to pick one that don't fit the mood. You know, I'm in a funk. I'm going to read one of these crazy things. What am I going to do? Is that even possible? I don't even believe somebody can experience that. <laughs> so fake. Or when you're feeling exalted, you know, you know what, I, I, I need a little bit of sobriety here. It's not always going to be up because I know objectively there's more to be purified in seven years. Um, and don't think you got to, I found all this information super helpful, um, especially just emphasizing David and his importance and, you know, uh, where he is in salvation history and how he prepares the way for Jesus. And, um, um, but, but clearly the Psalms are able to work in us at different levels. And, you know, a child who's, reach the age of, age of reason and can read can benefit from the psalms even if they don't even know what a son of Korah is you know, or, or, you know it's like okay well that's kind of neat to know but the scriptures can transform me and they do transform me even if I don't have full intellectual understanding you and I want to be humble and responsible as the Lord is leading us in life which is going to include study of the scripture and the church's teachings that we're just reading and looking up what he wants when but most of us are not called to be experts on the psalms um, uh, or experts on the old testament or whatever it's like we're supposed to be experts in the transforming love of god by having repented deeply of our sins and then let him fill with it and fill us with his spirit with his love deliver us from that and then doing our best to manifest it to the general community let us pray Heavenly Father, I ask you to grant your blessings upon these, your beloved children, and give you thanks for the gift of faith that has brought them uh, to this talk, to where they are right now in their life and relationship with you. We ask, Lord, that you increase their faith, increase their love, increase their hope, that they may know a greater outpouring of your spirit, that they may come to praise you in every aspect of their life, uh, both the joys and the sorrows, knowing that in due time, experience of this life will give way to the perfection of meeting with you for all eternity. We ask that you protect them from all the deceits and hatefulness of Satan, uh, and help them to become the saints they're called to be, and fill them with your praise forever. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.